everyone. Thanks a lot, Jean-Marc, uh, for the brief introduction. As he pointed out, my name is Fabio Andres. I'm an application scientist at Cryoptics, working in the headquarter in Badenswil, a little town very close to Zurich. And I'm very happy to go with you in the next couple of minutes through um, an introduction into our system, the technology, and show you, uh, of course, also um, applications. Today's seminar actually is uh, focusing on small mo molecules, so we will talk about binding kinetics no matter the size. So let's jump right into it, what's on the menu. I uh, want to lose a few words and say a few words about the company itself, uh, give a little overview on the history. We want to talk about real kinetics, what we consider to be real kinetics in the end. Um, and I want to introduce to you, of course, our main product, which is the wave system, the wave uh, delta system. And, and there, um, mentioning few, few of the of the of the important points and a uh, few of the important pillars of the system. We will talk about sensitivity, about time resolution, and about robust microfluidics. Um, and in the end, of course, I'm giving a little summary. So uh, the company um, is based in Vadenswil. That um, sometimes can be hard to pronounce. It's on at the lake. It's uh, at the western lake uh, shore of the Lake of Zurich. Uh, you see here a view towards south, more or less, with the Lake of Zurich in the background. And on clear days like this, you can see the Alps actually uh, in 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 the back. So it's a it's a pretty nice nice place to work, I would say. Um, what, com what the company does, what Cryoptics Sensors uh, does, uh, is driving innovation in kinetic analysis. And it's uh, developed in the past few years its own label-free optical biosensor system and technology, which is called GZI, Grating Coupled Interferometry. And I will explain to you just in a minute um, what's the basis of the technology also here uh, in this seminar. We have very robust microfluidics and also sophisticated software. That's what, what I want to want to uh, show you today in the next couple of minutes. So these terms, affinity, kinetics, of course, they are uh, used a lot in the in the biophysics field. Uh, what about them? Affinity, as you can see here on on, on this plot, we call ISO affinity plot. Uh, that you actually can look at um, molecular interactions that have the same affinity. Um, so if you move on such an ISO affinity line here, um, you can still get quite a diverse combination of on and off rates in the end. Of course, with, um, with a variety of equilibrium-based methods, you are able to look at equilibrated systems. So you mix your two binding partners together, uh, you, you let it equilibrate, and you look at the bond, uh, bound and the unbound fraction of the system, and you, you're able to get a KD. In the end, um, we're we're more also interested in the in the real in the real time kinetics of these interactions. And you see in a typical drug development pipeline, you would typically go from hits via leads to drugs, and in on this course, usually you will increase the affinity. However, the space here is not one dimensional; it's still two dimensional, and you can deal with um, various combinations of of kinetic rates, leading in the end to the same affinity. Um, as you can see on the right hand side, that's simulated data. These three uh, interactions actually share the same KD, so they show the same affinity in, in, uh, in an equilibrium um, analysis. However, if you look at the rates, you can see that clearly the blue um, has, has completely different on and off rates as compared to the green one. Um, we're doing measurements in real time on our system. Um, so we follow in real time binding and dissociation of molecules uh, very schematically and very simply depicted. Here on this slide, you see that we are uh, having a flow-based system. So we are injecting solutions onto a biosensor. Um, and here, schematically depicted as little y's is actually what we call ligand. So that's the to be immobilized or the immobilized binding partner which we immobilize on the biosensor. And then in the first phase, we would flow over running buffer, of course, to establish some sort of baseline. Uh, before, actually, then the next step, we're injecting an analyte uh, uh, solution at different concentrations. That's these different colors. 
and we will flow the analyte, which is depicted here as little green dots. Um, and we'll flow them over, over the ligand coated surface and we will follow in real time binding. We might reach or reach not uh, an equilibrium, so a horizontal dynamic equilibrium where binding and dissociation um, it's, are balanced out and, and are happening uh, at the same, same speed, so to say. And at some point we will, of course, inject running buffer again and follow in real time the dissociation of the molecules. So let me introduce to you uh, quickly the wave system. As you can see it here, that's the wave core. Or it's, it's, a, it's the core of, of the wave system, this magic little black box here, um, which um, enables you a few things and gives you certain advantages. And these topics are, as listed above here, mainly sensitivity and time resolution, we will talk about robust microfluidics and we will also talk briefly about flexibility in data evaluations. So what in the end the system provides you is, um, uh, is high performance and flexibility in terms of doing uh, kinetic analysis of uh, molecular interactions. So let's first um, talk a bit about sensitivity. Um, this is of course a subjective term also and we could start like um, uh, comparing uh, those two situations on the left hand side you see um, schematically depicted again um, uh, surface plasma resonance where you see that with, uh, with a light beam with a laser we would hit uh, a gold surface in a certain angle and we would create um, these name giving surface plasmon, plasmons on the surface which would be able to see and sense changes in the refractive index in a localized field here. Um, as we go to the right hand side and we're looking at waveguide interferometry, um, it's also of, of course an optical um, uh, readout, an optical method in the end and it works with a field. However, the light is here um, 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 carried in or it's coupled into a solid structure which we call a waveguide. And uh, running through um, that waveguide, it creates an evanescent field into the measuring area onto, onto the surface and this field is running continuously over the whole sensing area and is able to pick up refractive index changes in the end binding of, of molecules, the presence of molecules. However, having a continuous um, 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 evanescent field being present on the surface, we're able with this setup here to catch up more events, more binding events, and therefore get to a higher signal, um, which means a higher sensitivity. What Creoptics actually developed then as a proprietary technology is the grating coupled interferometry. Uh, we abbreviate uh, with GCI. Um, and the, the point here or the trick here is that we're actually coupling in the measurement beam uh, via um, a grating here, so that's a microfabricated structure that is able to diffract light and um, eventually then um, couple in light uh, into uh, the waveguide here. And we couple in a reference light beam via another grating into the very same solid structure into the very same waveguide, uh, which um, makes the system very robust and very stable and enables us to read the phase shift. So in the, in the end, we're measuring interference, inter, we're doing interferometry um, um, in the end with this setup, having both light beams traveling in the same waveguide, uh, measuring uh, phase shifts, so the interference with a very high uh, robustness and, and precision here. So what does that actually mean for your experiment? Uh, what, what does that enable you to do in the end, um, that high sensitivity? Um, and that's an example, like a little, little benchmark experiment where we show that we actually, um, of course, are able to um, mobilize high levels, high density of your ligand uh, protein on the, on the biosensor. Here it's carbonic anandrase. It's around 30 kilodaltons in size. And we are immobilizing to a, um, to a high density over here, getting a high uh, response, of course, for the analyte binding to it. However, if we decrease the density and we go to the middle and to the right hand side here, we see actually that if we leave the scale as it is, we barely see anything and the response, of course, gets proportionally smaller here. Um, however, for your experiments and for um, for, for some biophysical reasons, mainly um, um, 
uh, related to mass transport, you might actually want and it might be desired for you to go to low densities to, for example, avoid mass transport and diffusion um, effects for your systems. So if we blow up the axis here and you can appreciate this is the very same plot as in the middle, just we blew up the axis here and we see that actually this is um, a data that is very nicely and robustly described by a one-to-one -one kinetics without even taking into account diffusion limitation, mass transport limitation, whereas on the left-hand side actually um, we get, we use a model that includes mass transport and it gives you it gives us um, a, a coefficient also for, for the diffusion for the system. Whereas on the right-hand side, that's, uh, there is no need for that and we can directly look at the clean one-to-one -one interaction. That's really, that's um, uh, triplicate data. So it's um, each concentration is injected in a triplicate and we're able to resolve full robust kinetics even below 0.5 picograms per square millimeter. And at this point, I'd also like to mention briefly that one picograms per square millimeter, which is the unit that our system gives and reads, is directly equivalent to one RU um, uh, that you are uh, might be familiar with for SPR system as, for example, BioCore. Another example, a bit more applied now, together with a partner, one of our customers here, a pharma company, um, uh, that uh, was interested in looking at a, a drug target, a ligand that is rather big. So we're having a 110 kilodalton uh, sized protein here, and we're having a reasonably small compound of around 300 daltons. So the ligand to analyte molecular weight ratio is rather big. That means that we will be in this system limited in the response we're getting from the analyte binding to at the ligand because we're only able to immobilize so and so many epitopes because the ligand of course is a really big protein um, and still uh, we, we, we made uh, we, we wanted to show this and we immobilized um, up to almost saturation to a wave chip here we're getting uh, reasonable responses we can resolve reliably the kinetics and we're also here in the system able to go considerably lower with the ligand density and still get um, uh, reliable and robust kinetic data that can be nicely fit with a simple one-to-one -one binding model. Uh, another example where we're um, uh, measuring a small molecule binding or a kinetics of a small molecule binding to a, to a drug target is here an even more complex um, assay or a more complex system where we're looking at the GPCR, so a G protein coupled receptor, these inherently instable receptors that have to be somehow um, solubilized in a mixture, or here's just one uh, detergent. So we're having a more complex system, a more complex solution, more complex running buffer. Additionally, here the GPCR is also complex already. Um, with an orthosteric compound that is also pre present in the running buffer and is already in, the co in complex with the receptor. And then on top of that, after immobilizing the receptor via uh, its his tag onto a nickel NTA surface, we're able to measure clean and, and nice kinetics of um, the allosteric compounds here of interest um, uh, in, in an even more more, more complex and, and, and less clean system than the systems I showed you before that were measured in pure running buffer. Uh, so that's one of the rare examples where we can really, we really have shown that we can in this label-free um, uh, flow-based system uh, measure small molecules binding to GPCRs together with our, our, our um, customer Leadex Pro. So let's talk uh, a bit about time resolution. So what do I mean uh, when I say time resolution? Um, the wave chip actually um, is, um, is seen here in this little in this little photograph, uh, which is a close-up of the four channels. We're looking at a four-channel parallel channel um, uh, microfluidic flow system here. And what um, this is capable of is especially um, also um, doing very fast transition times. So it means that we can switch and transition very quickly in a very short amount of time between different solutions. For example, from the running buffer to a sample, a analyte, back from the analyte to the running buffer um, and do that very quickly. And with that, that, of course, enables you to measure quick rates, weak binders, binders that dissociate 
very quickly from, from their binding site. We use no integrated microvalves, so that's very important to state here because that's a fact that's making the system very robust also towards more crude samples, unpurified samples, body fluids. We will tackle that in a couple of minutes, the, the robustness part of the system. Here it's just also important to mention that we don't need any microvalves here that have to be close to the to the sensor surface in order to get a very sharp transition, but we're doing it via another strategy, another method. And how is that done? So what's the trick here? Um, uh, on, this, on this schematical representation here, you see a side cut. Um, we're looking from the side into a flow channel. Um, so the flow channel would be in blue here. You see the sensing area, and you can see that the the microfluidics shown here are not only connected to the main fluidics of the system via one inlet and one outlet, but rather there's several um, uh, in and outlets more. Um, namely, there is a sample inlet, there is a buffer inlet, and on both peripheral sides here, um, there's outlets um, going to the waste. And what we can do with that actually is, first of all, of course, we would want to inject running buffer that flows directly uh, um, into here, uh, then goes to the left because we have um, the outlet on the left hand side open and the, on the right hand side it's closed, so we're flowing running buffer and we're establishing a baseline. At some point we're doing something, a process we call sample preparation. and That is we're injecting the sample, your analyte, at a certain desired concentration of course, into the microfluidics here. However, still uh, the, the setup, the situation is that the outlet on the left-hand side is open and we're still closed on the right-hand side. That means that the sample is being prepared in this part of the microfluidics. And you can already see that the sample at its full concentration is here located and prepared very closely to the sensing area. And then uh, going in the next step just to a switch of the openings of the outlet. So we close on the left hand side, we open on the right hand side. We're able to get the sample at full concentration and, and in a very quick um, uh, time frame, short time frame onto the sensing area. And therefore it enables us to measure very quick rates. And of course, as a last step, we're injecting again running buffer here it flows directly over the sensing area and we're following in real time the dissociation again. So that's all very theoretical and very schematical. Um, so let's have a look at some, some data. What um, can you actually do with that? Um, I guess that's most interesting. So what we're looking at here is DNA, DNA interaction. So it's also some kind of a bit of a benchmarking study we did here measuring a rather weak interaction at different temperatures um, and going up to 25 degrees, we see actually that the rates get rather quick. If we're looking at the whole plot here, for example, we see that in the transition zones here, it looks like um, there's almost no curvature and that uh, it seems almost like, like a bulk shift. However, if we zoom in, um, for example, the dissociation region here, we see that we get all the curvature here in this very short time frame. Um, so it's fractions of a second here where uh, with, with the, again, with a simple one-to-one -one model, we're able to very nicely fit these off rates and look at interactions that are in this case already up to almost 10 per second in off rate, for example. And that's orders of magnitude um, quicker of an off rate than you can measure on any other comparable flow-based label-free system. Another um, example here would be, um, um, or another uh, application here would be a fragment screening, for example. Um, uh, fragments are inter inherently binding with very low affinities and are having quite quick rates also. We were able together with a partner uh, here with Roche, um, uh, able to measure a library of around 500 fragments of very small size that binds to a, a 25 kilodalton target protein that was amine coupled in this case onto um, the sensor surface here um, to, to several densities. And then we're screening uh, a whole library of, of, of fragments binding to it. 
you can see here that a, a normalized response plot that you would get from directly from the wave control software that um, uh, where you can put in your thresholds and you can normalize your signals, your binding signals, of course, to a positive control. As you can see here in red, the positive control signal is, is normalized to one and it's in repeatedly injected, injected over the whole course of the experiment to uh, take control over um, target or ligand degradation over time, and we can normalize for that. Um, additionally, what we did is we ran the whole assay, the whole screening a second time, and you see on the correlation plot on the right-hand side that actually we get a really nice correlation here between the two uh, independent measurements and assays. Such a screen here with 531 fragments can be um, carried out in two to two and a half days, um, not, not um, without demobilization here, and that is hands off measuring time. So that's a really automated um, uh, picking up of samples and um, subsequently injecting um, the, the fragments onto the surface. Another example here where we were interested into very quick kinetics, and that is THT, a small molecule um, uh, binding to, to fibrils, actually, amyloid fibrils, uh, which we, in this case, immobilized onto a PC set surface. That's a special uh, surface, a special wave chip you can order. Um, directly that has more balanced negative and positive charges. So it's a Switerionic surface. We were able to immobilize decent amounts of these fibrils. And then uh, I think almost for the first time, see as, uh, the THT binding, uh, binding to it. And again, on the full sensorgram, on the full plot here, you see it's almost looking like bulk shifts. And as there were no curvatures here. However, if you zoom into these regions, you see that we get nice, uh, curvature and that we can reliably and robustly fit the data to a one-to-one -one model, giving very high rates. Again, here we're looking, we're talking about an off rate of almost 11 per second. So I want to say a few words, as mentioned in the beginning already, about uh, the microfluidics and the, what, what actually, what parameters make it really robust. We call it no clock design. So um, as the whole microfluidics are actually integrated and, and are a part of the disposable chip itself here, it's really all the microfluidics are housed on the chip, it makes the, the system very robust. So if you get any clogging or any problem that are connected to the microfluidics or the surface, um, with this system, you're able to go on with a new chip just in, in, a, in a matter of minutes. And, and you don't have uh, really downtime and the need for, for big intervention interventions, um, for example, a maintenance on the machine, also if you're using very crude samples. And the system per se, the system um, as it is, actually is compatible with and tolerates a lot of very crude matrices, for example, undiluted serum plasma, um, undiluted cell supernatant from, from, from cell culture, from, for example, B cell clones in a 96 well plate, they can directly, without any purification, be injected into the system, and you would actually, um, in principle, never really, really harm the system or clog the system. And, and, and which, yeah, which means the system is very robust. You can even inject particles up to 1,000 nanometers. You could, for example, immobilize on the surface and then measure kinetics of uh, binding partners to it. With a fully protected sensor surface, and uh, this all gives you um, uh, mainly also very reduced downtime. Um, that's an off-rate screening of crude reaction mixtures, so it's again a screening approach. However, um, here we're not looking, as in the example before, only at levels and response levels. However, we're looking directly at the off rate. So the screening, um, um, uh, the screening part in the software actually allows you to evaluate such a screen directly um, uh, by looking at the single off rates of all uh, the members in the library. So here, uh, together also with the, with the customer here, we're injected 
uh, around uh, 80 crude non-purified compounds that are screened against a protein, pyruvate, dihydrogenase, kinase, PDK1 in this case, and on another channel, we are having a selectivity control. So we have HSP90 on another channel where we can follow in parallel at the same time, actually what's the selectivity and what's the difference in off rate. And that's just picked out three examples, three, um, three um, uh, members in the library uh, where you can see that compound one actually seems to be rather selective for PDK, uh, whereas for example, compound two here uh, shows shows more of a, of a similar um, uh, dissociation constant here, uh, which means it doesn't seem to be so selective. So from such a screening, from such an initial screen, you're able with the wave system to get much deeper information than just yes, no binding, but you get already um, very in-depth um, information on, on the kinetics, uh, on, the really, on, on really the biophysics of, of your system, and you can rank already uh, by other parameters than just yes, no binding. Uh, if you're looking at, um, or if you would want to profile antibodies, for example, as some diagnostic companies, as uh, the partner here actually uh, wants to look at, if you're interested in that, and for example, developing assays, diagnostic assays that have to work um, in the end in body fluids, in crude matrices, you might be interested in getting really the kinetics in that matrix of interest. Um, and here, um, very simply, antibody one on the top row actually seems to bind in both buffer and also 90% serum, uh, whereas antibody two the, seems to have completely abolished binding on, on uh, when measured in serum here. And you get not only the yes, no answer here from such an assay, but you got already full kinetic characterization of your, um, your antibody um, lead candidate uh, in serum and are able to characterize it and directly compare it also to buffer to 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 get yeah and that this this gets you much more much more information about uh, the biophysical properties of your lead candidates. A few words about data evaluation. So wave control, um, uh, the software um, has has quite quite uh, plenty of, of features and it's kind of a all in one package that enables you to go from designing your experiment. It has a built-in simulator also um, and really setting up your experiment and, and build your measurements um, up to um, uh, optimization also of your experiment. Um, you can use wizards uh, to automatically come to a very quick starting point, but then the software lets you full manual control on all the parameters um, that are associated with the injections itself and, and uh, the whole series you can manually really edit to detail also by hand if you want. Then the software does data adjustment. Uh, it does it also in a, in a kind of an automated way. But again, also here it leaves you the full freedom to control and to see uh, the adjustments yourself and change every parameter. Then it can, of course, evaluate your data, do your kinetic um, evaluation within the same software, in the same file, and in the end, even generate reports that you can export um, to PDF, to a Word file with templates, um, giving a full experimental report on your um, study. As a little summary or a little overview here uh, uh, over the whole system, that's that's the full cryoptics wave system. It consists of the wave core that houses, of course, all the fluidics, all the optical parts. It houses your running buffers, etc., and it houses the port where you insert your disposable chip. Then the wave chips. There's a whole selection, a whole list of different surfaces, also pre-derivatized surfaces that you can uh, right away order. Um, um, uh, from us. And then there's, of course, a wave sampler. That's the auto sampler. It houses two plates. So it has two positions where that you can equip either with plates, 96 well, or 384 well plates, or also racks for putting in vials for bigger volumes. And of course, wave control. So the whole system comes with the computer and wave control to um, actually run and, and, and analyze your measurements. That's to show that there's um, people uh, publishing um, quite interesting studies um, 
on a regular basis. So that's to say the system is out there. It's in use. Uh, people are making um, great signs with it and are acquiring great data sets with it that make their way into, into really interesting publications. Uh, that's some of our customers. Mainly, you can see that we're focusing so far mainly on the US and on Europe. And you see that uh, the range here is uh, from biotech companies via really uh, more uh, full, full um, um, pharmaceutical companies uh, also to academic research groups and academic uh, institutes. Uh, more and more uh, of our customers are giving us uh, valuable feedback um, and that's really, um, that's really very, very valuable for us to also hear back from our customers, from you in the end. Um, what are the experiences people make with the system? What does it really enable them to do? Uh, what benefit does it bring to their pipelines, to their way of working? And we're very happy to get, to get these, these kind of feedbacks from customers that use our system really a lot and, and, and have really integrated the wave um, into their, their pipelines. There's more events coming up, so I'm approaching uh, the end here. Um, I want to also um, show you quickly that we recently had a seminar uh, which was focusing on biophysical characterization of biologics. Um, uh, together with Dr. Sean Owen from uh, the uh, University of Utah, together with my colleague uh, Ellen Lee, which is also an application scientist at Creoptics, and that already um, uh, passed here. But if you click on this link, uh, we're very happy if you would um, uh, if you would go there and you can um, watch a full the full recording of that seminar. So I think it's fair to state that we have seen that sensitivity meets robust microfluidics. Um, and that we have seen that we can study kinetics, real kinetics, even at very large analyte to ligand uh, ratios, uh, what concerns the molecular weight, up to one to thousand we have shown already. Um, we have seen that we can run experiments and studies with very crude mixtures, detergents, other additives without ever clogging the system, which really widens, widens the range and, and the, the possible uses of the system. Uh, we have seen that we can screen, rank, and characterize weak binders with off rate up to 10 per second in our hands, in our um, uh, laboratories, we even um, uh, robustly characterized a, a, a system which had an off rate up to 15 per second. And so you can look at really weak binding events and, and, and get in-depth kinetic biophysical information very early on in your pipeline, for example, in your screening um, phase. And I guess that's a bit the motto uh, of Cryoptics, keep kinetics real. Um, and, uh, and, and that's what the, what the system shows, I think, uh, of which we're, we're quite proud. And with that, I want to thank you very much for attending, uh, for dialing in here in this um, um, uh, virtual seminar. Um, my name is also written down here again. There's also an email address. You can um, also you can approach us on, on different channels, of course. Um, but you can also approach me directly in case later on um, there's some more questions, uh, more interest, more specific questions appearing. I'm very happy to answer them to you. And of course, I'm also now very happy to take your questions and try to answer them as good as possible. And with that, I'd like to thank you very much. And I'm handing over back to Jean-Marc. OK, thank you so much, uh, Fabio, for your accurate presentation. Some questions have already started. So the first one is a question about fast kinetics. Could you show examples comparing, you know, uh, K of values obtained by GCI with those obtained by stop it flow? So right now, actually, I cannot pull up a comparison study that directly compares to stopped flow, unfortunately. So we haven't done really a direct benchmarking study there but these are really um, also for us um, yeah ongoing projects and really of course really valuable 
and we're at the moment really putting effort in this and and working on on on, on benchmarking our system directly to other to other methods thank you a new question how do you prevent mixing of the sample with the running buffer within the flow cell um also thanks for that question i think um that points um again uh at, at uh, the process that I explained uh, briefly in the beginning um, that we call sample preparation. So that's actually all um, uh, made and ensured in the sample preparation process. Um, I'm not exactly sure if you still can see my slide. Maybe, Shomar, can you confirm quickly that you can see my slide still? No. So do you wish I would turn back in the normal mode? Yes. OK, you can see it. I can also um, explain it verbally. Um, so what we're doing actually is we're injecting the sample into the microfluidics, but not yet directly onto the sensing area, but into a region on, within the microfluidics that is very close, really just adjacent to the sensing area. And then by just opening a valve or, or a little port on the other side of the microfluidics, we have the sample at its full concentration traveling just a very short distance and is 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 um, seeing on the sensing area very quickly at its full concentration without any dilution effects. Thank you. Another new question: Small molecules often induce conformational changes in their targets. Do you think the GCI signals correspond purely to mass increase due to small molecule binding? or also to mass redistribution due to conformational changing? Yes, thanks for that question. Uh, so um, we, um, we're having quite a lot of discussions about um, uh, conformational change. And as, as of now, my opinion or my thinking here is that conformational changes, so mass distributions on the sensor, are actually happening on a very small scale if you compare it to the binding event. So the binding event, the binding of your analyte to your drug target or to your protein will always kind of uh, mostly dominate the signal. And that's why probably directly seeing, however, uh, theoretically it, 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 it's well possible and you, you, you should be able to see um, also conformational changes. However, I think the scale within which such such uh, changes uh, actually impact the overall refractive index on the sensor are happening on a, on a very small scale and that's why your signal and your curves will mostly be dominated by the binding signal however what we can do and what we have also studied before is we can uh, also indirectly look at uh, the effect of conformational change on um, the, the actual kinetics. So we can use a mathematical model, and we have that already ready to use, implemented in the software, that actually takes into account that there is a conformational change step um, uh, happening um, between binding of the analyte and the dissociation. So we take account uh, for this um, um, in, in, in the model, in the analysis. So that's a rather indirectly looking at conformational change, changes, but that's well possible. And we're um, actually at the moment in a collaboration with um, Helena Danielson uh, in Uppsala. So that's a bit the, the, uh, um, the center or, um, of, of biophysics. And, and she's very interested in seeing conformational changes. And we uh, are uh, measuring and seeing quite interesting data on that topic right now. Thank you. So uh, also concerning the no clog macrophytic feature, what happens if my sample precipitates out during run on contact with ligand? Um, thanks for that question. Um, I think uh, the, the worst thing that might happen on a system like this, on the wave system, is that uh, you will lose kind of the information from, from, from binding. So if your sample actually precipitates and goes out of solution um, in in the microfluidics on the biosensor while it it encounters and sees your ligand, you're actually uh, mainly yeah compromising your measurement and you might not yeah look at the, the the concentration as you think the concentration is because apparently you have lost some of the molecules in 
that that precipitated. The system per se, um, I can mention that again, is very robust. So you will never clog and harm the system with that. And in most cases, if you get precipitation, you would kind of flow the precipitates over the flow cell. They would exit the flow cell or the dye sensor on the other side. And, and you would not harm the system or your whole experiment. Of course, if you're working at the concentration where you have precipitation of your analyte, you would need to optimize and adjust your experimental setup and probably go to, to lower concentrations um, as, as, as you basically cannot, cannot um, hold um, or these high concentrations in solution, right? So you would never really mess up um, with the system it, itself or in many cases also not with the measurement but probably you would lose some insight and some information of that particular injection okay another question please how many times can i reuse a chip it's also a good question thanks for that so um, basically the, the the wave chips are considered disposable so in very generally speaking um you would insert such a chip into the machine. You would immobilize your uh, your ligand of whatever nature it might be, and then um, you're you're basically free to measure as long as the system gives you good data, right? So if you um, after 24 hours of screening and flowing over several hundreds or thousands of of, 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 of molecules, you still see activity. You're, of course, uh, can inject some, some kind of a positive control and see what's the loss in activity, you're able uh, to measure on, on that very chip surface. Um, as soon as you remove a chip from the system, um, um, then actually we would highly recommend to go um, to, um, to a new chip surface, to a, ch to a fresh uh, uh, chip surface at that point. Okay. Also another one on the macrofluidics. Uh, I see that it is integrated, but the flow cell is made of what? Polycarbonate? So the flow cell, I think, um, and here, uh, to be very honest, I'm not absolutely sure. Um, I think it's made of some silicon-based material, um, so the flow cell per se. And then, of course, we have the surface, which is tantalon oxide to which we couple our matrix, whatever it is. Uh, our standard uh, chip matrices are uh, polycarboxylate. So that's then really the matrix um, where, where you get um, your molecules attached by amine coupling or by any other immobilization techniques. Um, 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 yes, exactly. So, so, so the basis of the biosensor there is, is tantalon oxide. So it's not gold as compared in SBR. And to that, um, we couple, or together with our supplier, with our partner, we couple uh, the, the polycarboxylate chains uh, to build up the, the, the matrix. Thank you. The last question, can you elaborate on how to choose an appropriate immobilization capture strategy for protein binding? I um, kind of missed the first part of the question. Can you repeat that, Sean? Can you elaborate on how, how to choose an appropriate a mobilization capture strategy for protein binding? Mm -hmm. Sure, that's also a very good question. And um, maybe I can start saying that the, 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 the range of uh, the, the whole portfolio of wave chips that we directly offer already offer you quite, quite, a, quite a broad range of possibilities on how you can immobilize um, your protein. And um, how you actually, in the end, immobilize your protein comes down very much onto um, which specific tags, for example, you have available on your protein. Um, uh, and furthermore, of course, you can always consider thiol or amine coupling, so standard coupling um, chemistry, so a standard coupling chemistry for immobilizing covalently proteins onto a matrix. Um, is, for example, amine, amine coupling, where you would inject EDC-NHS mixture um, to activate the polycarboxylic carbo groups on, on the PC surface and then um, inject your protein and, and couple the, 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 the primary amines directly to those activated groups. However, if you 
have tags available, for example, a his tag on your protein or a biotinylation on your pro protein, you might um, look into other approaches and we deliver right away um, specialized chip surfaces, for example, uh, pre-derivatized with streptavidine. So we have, for example, uh, PCH or PCP streptavidine pre-coated chips that you can right away use to, for example, capture your protein by via its biotin um, and to that chip. So there's a variety of methods and it really very much comes down to what do you have in your hands and what tags um, do you have available on your protein. Okay. A last question appeared. Have you tried immobilization of streptac 2 proteins on the wave ship using uh, streptavidin for capturing? Um, also, thanks for that question. Actually, we have tried that. We even had some uh, some discussions of some someday maybe come up with a with a with a, uh, a product um, that would enable this right away on the chip. But you're very very free to immobilize um, streptactin um, yourself by, for example, amine coupling. And we have done that, and we have shown that this works as expected. You can immobilize streptactin. Uh, by amine coupling, and then uh, capture your strep tag, um, uh, strep tagged proteins on such a surface. Yes. Okay, so thank you uh, for your listening time. I don't see any more questions on my screen. So uh, I would like to thank you so much for your listening time. I hope we pick you up interest in our technology. So uh, before finishing our session, indeed the next session will be uh, on the topics of uh, GPCR webinar. It's scheduled this Thursday, you know, at uh, 8 p.m. in European time. You will receive a copy of our presentation. And of course, if you wish to be in contact with one of our sales contacts, please drop us an email at sales at proptics.com or visit our website. Thank you so much again, and I wish you a nice day for everyone. Bye-bye, take care. Also from my side, thank you very much for dialing here. It was a pleasure to, to show you through our system. Thanks a lot and have a nice day. Thank you. Bye again.